Well, good morning, Body of Christ. As the preaching minister here at Central, I'd just like to start off by saying the same thing to you as what the Apostle Paul uh, wrote to God's holy people in Philippi, recorded in Philippians chapter 1, uh, where Paul writes, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to the completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how long how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And so as we uh, enter into uh, week three of uh, our online church, I do want to express thanksgiving to God for all of you. I want to encourage each of us to pray with joy for one another and remember that we are in this work together. We are partners one with another to continue to advance the church in this culture. And I pray that we would continue to grow in love and wisdom and strive to be pure and blameless until the coming of Christ. We are serving the Lord together and, and I'm thankful that we are together and, and not alone because in some ways this world is uh, very scary. We are living in some very uncertain times but, but we're not alone. We have each other and we have the Lord who has promised in his word to never leave us, never forsake us. In Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, it says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And so we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. I heard a funny story one time that uh, Wayne Shaw told. He told a story about a farmer who had a really bad year. And uh, sometimes uh, when we're having a bad year, uh, we resort to desperate things. Well, uh, this farmer was having a bad year. And so in desperation, he decided to rob a bank. And he drove around the block 30 times before finally parking in the alley. And he put on a ski mask and he put a gun in the bag. And once inside the bank, he handed the teller the gun, he pointed to the bag, and he said, don't stick with me, this is a mess up. Well, things are not that desperate here at Central, but I do want to encourage us to continue to joyfully and even gladly support the work here at Central with our finances. The Bible says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. And so I pray that, that each, of, each one of us will, will give and we'll do our best to be generous on all occasions. 
we're living in a in a crazy world right now and it seems like our world is um, every man for themselves it, it seems like we're just consumed by stockpiling uh, things in our home and and uh, even trampling people for simple things like toilet paper and i think what an opportunity that we have as christians to to not be like the world and to uh, use every opportunity that we have to be generous one with another and i think what a testimony that is in a a culture that's going crazy to be generous on all occasions and and be able to point people to Jesus. Remember again, if you're sending your financial gifts through the mail, please use PO Box 557 in Gearing, or you can give online through our website, or you can uh, bring your gift to the office during the normal office hours Monday through Thursday. Today is traditionally known as Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Jesus was crucified, buried, and raised. This day is celebrated as the day of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Jesus arrived in Bethany. He rode a donkey's colt into Jerusalem, just as the prophets had said. He was celebrated by multitudes as the coming king. And this all happened right as preparations were being made for the Passover, and thousands of Jewish pilgrims were present. The king comes the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus knows what he will face as he comes into Jerusalem. He knows who he is and, and what God wants him to do, and he is willing to pay however much it will cost him. He is committed to the will of the Father above all else as he fulfills God's word and gives his life for you and for me. The question I have for us this morning is do you know, do I know who we really are? Do you accept the full responsibility of being created in God's image and likeness? And do you know any people who are in the darkness who need to see the light? Listen to Peter's words, but you were a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Jesus would tell us in the sermon, on the Sermon on the Mount to be salt and light and, and point people to Jesus. Won't you do that this week? The great commandments and the great commission sum up the whole purpose of God for your life and my life. I pray that we will put God's word into practice this week. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all of Jesus' commands. God bless you as you do that this week. I'm going to pray. And then the praise team will lead us in a time of singing our songs to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this opportunity that we have this week to be your holy people, to be salt and light and, uh, and, and just permeate culture. God, I pray that uh, you would give us opportunities to, to be generous, to, to be different, in this world. Uh, God, as we see uh, a world that's uh, running uh, in panic and not knowing where to turn, God, help us to just be consistent in our witness to you. And as we have opportunity, help us to be able to bless people with a smile, with, uh, 
with a good deed, with an offer to pray for people, um, whatever we can do uh, and, and still be safe in this culture. But help us to do the things that we do because we want people to know that uh, in Christ, we don't have to be afraid. So God, help us this week as we attempt to be your church beyond these walls. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, Central family. We're glad that you're joining us again today as we come together to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's sing to him.
return to you. In your kingdom, broken hearts are made new. You make us new. Because when we see you, we find strength to face. into our midst and celebrate the fact that he is here with us. You know, every week we have the opportunity to share with one another because of Jesus, because of the, the price that he paid for our sins. He gave his life for us, and so let us give our life in worship to him. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and
Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. The fact that you sent him to this earth to be the the sacrifice for us. He has paid our, our debt and we now can stand before you clean because of him. Thank you for Jesus. We ask now, Lord, that you prepare our hearts and our minds to receive your word. May your spirit work through us, amongst us, and may it overflow to the world around us, a world that so desperately needs you now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe you heard about the Minneapolis couple uh, who decided to go to Florida to thaw out during a particularly icy winter. They, they planned to stay at the same hotel that they stayed at uh, uh, on their honeymoon 20 years uh, earlier. Uh, because of their hectic schedules, though, it was difficult for the couple to coordinate their travel plans. And so the husband left Minnesota and flew to Florida on Thursday while his wife planned to fly down the following day. And the husband checked into the hotel, and there was a, a computer in his room, so he decided to send an email to his wife. And However, he, uh, he accidentally left out one letter in her email address, and he sent the email without realizing her error. And so meanwhile, somewhere in Houston, a, a widow had just returned home from her husband's funeral. And he was a minister who was called home following a heart attack, and And the widow decided to check her email, expecting some sort of condolences and messages of sympathy. But after reading her first email, she screamed and fainted. The widow's son rushed into the room, found his mother on the floor, and saw the computer screen which read, To my loving wife, I've just arrived today. I know you're surprised to hear from me. They have computers here, and you are allowed to send emails to your loved ones. Since I've just arrived, I thought I would send you an email. Everything has been prepared for your arrival tomorrow. Looking forward to seeing you then. Hope your journey is as uneventful as mine was. P.S. Sure is hot down here. (laughs) Got got that that hot down here? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, on a more serious note, I just want to thank God for this body of believers, this congregation, uh, for what you mean to me and for the privilege I have of, of serving here. I hope that you realize what a special blessing we have to be with each other this morning and to, to celebrate together that Jesus Christ is Lord. Maybe you've heard the story about the 10-year-old boy who was doing miserably in math in public school. And his parents had heard the 
that students who attended private schools did much better in math than most students in public schools. And this family had no church home, and, and they, were, uh, they only attended church every now and then, but they decided to send their son to a Catholic school. And the math papers he brought home uh, immediately showed dramatic improvement in his math skills. And at the end of the first grading period, he had an A in math, and his parents were just flabbergasted. They were so excited, ecstatic. They, they couldn't believe that their son made an A in math, and they couldn't figure out what made the difference. So they asked him. And the son said, well, the first day in school, I sat down at my desk, and at the front of the room, I saw a man nailed to a great big plus sign. I figured, they take their math seriously here, so I better buckle down. Today is Palm Sunday. We celebrate a Jesus coming into Jerusalem to a king's celebration. But we also remember how just a few days after the triumphal entry that Jesus was betrayed by Judas and brought before the Jewish ruling council, the, the Jews took Jesus to the Gentile governor Pilate and Pilate allowed Jesus to be crucified on a cross. And it certainly appeared that Satan had won. Jesus was dead. His disciples were scattered. God had suffered defeat. Or had he? Three days later, Jesus was alive from the dead. Over a period of 40 days, he showed himself alive to hundreds of people. And then 51 days later, Peter explained that it had all been part of God's plan. Peter said, Peter, he, he said Jesus was delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God. And those words tell us that what happened on the cross was not an accident. As foolish as it may have seemed at the time, it was God's plan from the very beginning of time. It was a plan that didn't seem to make much sense. A plan that looked to all the world like craziness. But the Son did exactly what the Father wanted Him to do. And He died on the cross for the sins of the human race. Paul would explain it best of all when he wrote, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I want you to go back in your minds for a few minutes to the scene of the cross, the scene of the crucifixion. There was Jesus hanging on a cross just out the, outside the city walls of Jerusalem at Golgotha, the place of the skull. It was a rocky hill that some people say was shaped like a skull. It was a, a grim name for a very grim place where grim things were done. And imagine, if you will, the men who stood around Jesus as He hung there, mostly His enemies. They, they could finally breathe a sigh of relief. Yes, it was true that Jesus had attracted quite a gathering of people. And it was true that Jesus had undeniably performed miracles. It was even true that Jesus had made fools of them as they tried to trap Him in His words. But they could grant Him the triumphs of yesterday because this day they felt very confident that the victory was theirs. They had managed to capture Jesus without a fight, rush Him through the mockery of a Jewish trial, and even have Him convicted by the Roman authorities all in one night before most of the Jews in Jerusalem even knew what was going on. They had succeeded in finding him guilty of treason, a crime that was punishable by death on a cross. And so there they stood at the foot of the cross, watching Jesus, eyes filled with hatred, eyes filled with vengeance, eyes filled with contempt for a man who had made life uncomfortable for them for three years. 
They stood mocking Him, accusing Him, words of scorn and ridicule. And recorded in Matthew 27, and those passing by were hurling abuse at Him, wagging their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Well, Jesus, things aren't looking too good for you right now, are they? You were a big talker while you were down here with us. What have you got to say for yourself now? You still, you still have plans to rebuild the temple? You are a carpenter and you do have nails in your hands now. You've got wood at your disposal. Go build your temple. Perform a miracle now, miracle man. Come down from the cross. And if you do that, we'll believe you. Just one miracle and all of us will be believers. We'll never doubt you again. Just come down from the cross. Matthew 27, 42 goes on. He saved others. He cannot save Himself. He's the King of Israel. Let Him now come down from the cross and, and we will believe in Him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue Him now if He delights in Him. For He said, I am the Son of God. Can you just hear the antagonism in the, the voices? Come on, Jesus! If you're really the Christ, come down from the cross. They probably shouted till they were hoarse. The noise was so great that perhaps only a few of them standing near the cross heard what Jesus said when He finally moved His lips in prayer. Father, forgive them, for they do not knew do, they do not know what they do. There were a lot of things that were said that day that were cruel. There were a lot of things that were said that were untrue. But there was one thing that his enemy said to him that day that had a great deal of truth in it. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking with the scribes and elders said, and here's the true part, he saved others. Himself, He cannot save. He saved others. Himself, He cannot save. Sure, He healed the lame. And sure, He made them walk again. And yes, He gave sight to the blind. And yes, He made withered hands whole again. He even brought back the dead. But look at Him now. He can't even save Himself. There was an element of truth in that statement. In one sense, they were absolutely right, but they were also wrong. You see, he could have saved himself if he wanted to. He could have compromised with the priests or made a bargain with Caiaphas. He could have talked things over with Pilate. Pilate was looking for an excuse to uh, not crucify him. He could have made his kingdom political instead of spiritual and gained a greater and more influential following. He could have chosen the easy thing to do instead of the right thing. He said to Peter in the garden, or do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father and He will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? He said, all I have to do is say the word. Yes, Jesus had the ability to avoid the plotting and devices of wicked men. He could have saved Himself. He had the power. But then He would have never been our Savior. Because had He chosen to save Himself, there would have been no hope for saving us. And that's one of the great paradoxes about salvation. He saved others, but to do that, He couldn't save Himself. Now, it's a truth that, you know, that we recognize in other areas of life. Think about an acorn. An acorn must be willing to die if it is to produce an oak tree. A soldier must be willing to die if he intends to save his country. 
A shepherd must be willing to die if he wants to save his sheep. So when Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, sought to bring about the salvation of his sheep, there was no other way to save us than to lay down his life for us. He said, I lay down my life for the sheep. And a few verses later, he said, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. And that's so true. You know, in a sense, it wasn't the nails that held Christ to the beams of the cross. It was His love for us that held Him there. For to love is to be willing to give oneself for the one that we love. As Jesus said the night before His crucifixion, He said, this is My commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this that one lay down his life for his friends. And so Jesus loved us and gave himself for us. He, he saved others, but he couldn't save himself. But couldn't Christ have saved us without the shedding of his precious blood? Why did he have to die as he did, cut off in the prime of his life at, at age only 33? Could he not have sat like the Greek philosophers before him in the shade of some garden to seek the wisdom that would save the world? If he had been only a teacher of men, a, a philosopher, he might have done these things, but he came to be our Savior. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And salvation had to come by the shedding of blood, as the writer of Hebrews said, without shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. Yes, Christ had a deeper work to do. He came not only to teach, but to redeem. Peter would say, you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Can I take a moment and get just a little bit more personal? Suppose I suddenly became very penitent and wanted to make Atonement for all the wrongs that I'd ever done. What a tremendous task that would be. Because I would think first of yesterday. And I would remember the things I had said that had hurt someone else. And I would say, let me take the pain that I caused you and bear it myself. And I would go to everyone whom I'd hurt with words and I would gather up the pain and I'd lay all that on my own heart. And then I would remember the deeds that I did yesterday which were wrong. Deeds that hurt other people and deeds that hurt God. And I'd say, let me bear the consequences of my actions. Let me suffer for my wrongdoings. And then I would remember the day before yesterday and do the same thing. And the day before that, and the day before that, and then last week and last month, last year, and if my conscience laid upon me the just punishment for all my sins, my heart would be crushed beneath the weight of it. I simply couldn't bear it. In fact, I couldn't go very far into the yesterdays to make restitution without being crushed. So that no matter how much I loved you, I could never take your sorrow or your punishment because I have so much of my own. So what we need to do is we need to find someone whose burden is light. Someone whose life is not weighed down with sin. Someone who was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. And Jesus Christ, of course, is the only one who meets our needs because He had no sin of His own. And because He loves us, because He loves you and me, He says to us, I'll take your burden. I'll take the pain that you have caused. I'll take your sorrow. I'll take your disappointment. I'll take your disgrace. I'll take your shame. I will take them and I will carry them for you. And the punishment that you cannot bear, I will bear. And He gathered it all up. 
And Paul would say, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. I don't understand all that. I don't know the specifics of how Jesus became sin for us. But I do know that because that happened, He found Himself separated from God as He cried out on the cross, My God, My God, why have You forsaken Me? And that explains the mystery of Christ on the cross. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening up for our well-being fell upon Him. And by His scourging, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to His own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us to fall on Him. And the amazing fact is that Jesus would have made that sacrifice if I was the only person in the world or if you were the only person in the world. That is how much He loves us. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time understanding that kind of love. I have a hard time understanding why Jesus would leave heaven in the first place. I have a hard time understanding Philippians chapter 2 where we read that Jesus, who although He existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied Himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Jesus has always been God. He lived in heaven, had angels serving Him, a place of prominence and power, and He gave it all up for us. I like to read Rubel Shelley, books by Rubel Shelley. Rubel Shelley once told about a time when he was 16 years old. It was the practice of the ladies' Bible class in his congregation to fix up food baskets with grocery items at Christmas time to take to the needy families in the area. And then the teenagers would deliver them around the community. And he recalls going to one shack which was well off the beaten path. It was just a run-down little shack, but there were three generations of family living in it. Nine people in all. When the door was opened, a terrible smell came out. A smell of sickness, of rotting food, of soiled bedclothes. They quickly mumbled something about being from the Church of Christ and wanting to help them out. And they, gave him the, and they gave them the groceries. And as soon as they got back to the car, they took a big, deep breath of fresh air just trying to get the odor out of their lungs. Now imagine someone telling you to go visit that family. Or suppose that someone suggested that to really help them out, you should actually move in with them. Maybe even for a few weeks and help them clean up and take care of their sickness. Breathe that air and live in that filth. And if I'm being brutally honest, I don't think I have that kind of love. But that's exactly the kind of decision Jesus made when He emptied Himself and became a man. The simple thing would have been to come down to the earth for a short while to teach. It wouldn't take that long. And then He could just go back to heaven. He could take a deep breath of fresh air and say, I'm glad I didn't have to stay in that any longer. But He had a love great enough that only a divine being could possess it that caused Him to literally move in with us. So He was born kicking and screaming into this world. He grew up to sweat and He got blisters and He got hungry. He got thirsty and He knew what it meant to get hot and He knew what it meant to have to go to work. And He knew what it meant to have people misunderstand His motives and lie about Him and to have His friends turn on Him and one of His very best friends to deny Him three times. To stand up and say three times, I don't even know the man. He moved into our smelly, stinky situation and He took our sin, our frailty, our weakness upon Him. And He carried it to the cross. 
he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So let me ask you this morning, what can you do with a Savior like that? What can you say in the face of that kind of love? His enemies at the cross said he saved others himself he cannot save. And they were right. Because Jesus could not save himself if he was to save us. But I think it's important that we recognize that the law of sacrifice, which demanded the life of Christ, must also be the law in our own lives. For it is certain that if we desire to follow Him and do as He commands us, we also must be willing to give up our lives. It was Jesus who said, If anyone wishes to come after Me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow Me. Like Jesus, we too must be willing to give up of ourselves. Our goal is to reach the point where we can say, as Paul did, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself up for me. Some of us from time to time have been known to say such things as, well, I don't believe we have to attend every service. After all, a fellow's got to rest sometimes. Or I just really don't feel like being involved in the work of the church. I'm just too busy with other things. But then we see Jesus hanging on the cross, shedding His blood for us. Body of Christ, a Lord like that deserves our full commitment and our full support. If our souls are to be saved in eternity, they must be lost to this age. If they are to be saved for the treasures that rust does not corrupt, they must be lost to the riches of this world. And if they are to be saved for heaven, they must be lost to this world. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. To the early martyrs, the world said, you can't save your bodies if you refuse to worship Caesar. And they were right. Those early Christians couldn't save their bodies it was because they were living in such a way that they might save their souls. Society today says you can't follow the riches and pleasures of this life if you want to follow Christ. And that's true. And that's why Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. The world says you can't be popular if you continue to hold to that narrow-minded view of Christianity. And they're right, you can't. Because to achieve certain goals, you have to be willing to give up certain things. What they said at the foot of the cross was true. He saved others... Himself He cannot save. He was a king who failed in the eyes of the world in order to gain eternal victory in the eyes of God. And we have to be willing to do the same thing if we desire to spend an eternity with Him. I understand that it seems to be the foolish thing to do. The world wants to live it up the world wants to enjoy its pleasures. The world wants to laugh and have a good time, and those things certainly have their place. But Christ reverses things. The cross 
comes before the crown. The sorrow comes before the joy. The lowly shall be exalted. The mourners shall be comforted. It's a plan that doesn't seem to make much sense, and and I would agree were it not for the fact that it's a plan that has come from our Heavenly Father. 1 Corinthians 1.25 says, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. There is a song entitled, God's Own Fool by Michael Card, which is about this very idea. The chorus of that song says, When we in our foolishness thought we were wise, He played the fool and He opened our eyes. When we in our weakness believed we were strong, He became helpless to show we were wrong. The love that Jesus showed us through His death is difficult to understand. But it is a death that deserves our full commitment in return. The question I raise as we close the lesson this morning is, how will you react to the One who loved you so much? If you're not yet a Christian, you can bring that blood of Jesus into contact with your life by dying to the sin that is in your life through faith, being buried in the watery grave of baptism to be raised to walk in newness of life. And if you're already a child of God this morning, be reminded that you owe a tremendous debt to that One who gave His life for you. It's a debt that can never be repaid but one which demands your full allegiance and your full service. He saved others, but He couldn't save Himself. That was true because He died for you. Won't you make up your mind that you're going to live for Him? Let's pray. Father, I pray today that we would be pricked to the heart God, that we would be willing to realize how great a love You have for us. Help that phrase to sink in, He saved others, Himself He cannot save. God, thank You for saving us. Thank You for giving us life and eternal life. And thank You for giving us purpose on this earth. And even though... Right now, we are just going through a a tremendous test, a tremendous trial. Seems like everything is just sort of falling apart. And yet, if we're content in You, while everything else is falling apart, our lives are not. And so God, help us to... uh, Understand Your great love for us and help us to give our lives back to You in return. Help us to serve one another. Help us to be salt and light in this world and help us to point others to You. We thank You in in Jesus' name. Amen. And so just as we kind of prepare our hearts for communion this morning, uh, let me just remind you of... uh, very familiar verse recorded in John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. You know, from the creation of the world to the beautiful Garden of Eden, God was shouting, I love you. From the freeing of the Israelites from Egypt to their entering into the promised land, God was saying, I love you. From an animal's feeding trough called a manger in the little town of Bethlehem where God's own son was laying, God was shouting, I love you. From the cross of Calvary where Jesus hung, suffering, bleeding, and dying for the sins of the world, God was shouting, I love you. From an empty tomb near Golgotha from which Christ arose from the dead, God 
was shouting, I love you. And even now, from these small pieces of bread representing the body of Christ, and from these small cups representing the blood of Christ, each and every Lord's Day, God is still shouting, I love you. And so this morning, as you put that bread into your mouth, and you take the cup to your lips, remember that God sent His Son into the world once to take away our sin. He will send Him again. Jesus will come again. And He's going to take us home. From the glories of heaven, God is still shouting, I love you. So God, as we partake this morning of this bread and this cup, help us to remember assuredly how much you love us. God, thank you for Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.